I'm Dan John, and welcome to our weekly attempt to answer all the questions that get sent in. Now listen, if you have questions, remember, email them to me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Um, it's, it's a real honor to answer questions, and I, I, I often learn as much as everybody else. So uh, before I jump in, uh, I just want to make a, a point of clarification, and that's on me. So uh, I often refer uh, in emails and things to something called the IC, and it was only an, uh, it was only until a few days ago that I even noticed there was any uh, issues. So IC it means two things to me. The first is intentional community. Uh, I've been using that term since about 2010 when I moved out for a few years to Burlingame, California, and Dan Martin and a group of us started a thing called the Coyote Point Kettlebell Club. And the idea is every week we would get together intentionally to form a community to train together, intentional community. And I quickly realized that it might be the single best way to organize training in my life. Uh, I'm a strong believer, if you can do it, uh, at least one day a week, get together with friends and they don't even have to be uh, people you know very well, but if they have the same passion for improvement, very quickly they'll become your friends. You bring whatever equipment you have, you bring water, you bring food, uh, you get a workout in, you learn from each other, you make mistakes, you, and then you try to get better. Uh, it's my favorite workout. Um, I'm to the point now that about five days a week I do uh, intentional community workouts. I almost call it the IC. The other I see is my inner circle. Um, we have this group of people, um, and I know you can sign up for it, and the information is right, like right there. Um, it is a coaching group. We meet weekly. We have one-on-one -on -one calls. We talk about things. But in the inner circle, it reminds me a lot of intentional community, which is why I bring this up. And, and I can see why my mind moved to both of these being the same thing. It's the same idea because of the, the distance. And we're talking about, we have people, you know, international, all over the world, people come and join us, uh, you know, to get the scheduling to work can be tough. People make sacrifices to get online uh, at the right time. Uh, we have several offerings for times, but it's just hard to make it happen sometimes. Well, if I'm working on something, if you're working on something, we talk about it in real time in a call with other people listening and, and discussing the ideas. In our last group, we had a couple people start the Velocity Diet. Uh, that's the diet I use every so often. <laughs> it turns out about every 15 years. Uh, two of the members went on it. One of the members brought in another friend to do it too. And so they all had accountability buddies to make everything work. To me, that's the best use of the internet I've ever seen. Uh, you have a group, you live, you live here, I live six time zones to the east, and yet we're, we care about each other, we're working on things together, and we're trying to make uh, each other uh, uh, better, happier people, and I, and I love it. So intentional community is the, are, are those weekly meetings we get together and train. Inner circle, also an IC, is that online thing we do. Uh, I can see down the line that those two concepts are going to get blurred more and more in my head, but I want to make sure I brought it up right away. And I do apologize and thank the person who emailed me about the confusion. So I appreciate that. Um, sometimes in my world, I use words that have common meanings. Like I'm going to, if I say I'm going to clean my kitchen, it means I'm probably going to get some product and, you know, wipe down things. If I say I'm going to clean my barbell, it means something completely different. And there can be confusion, and I certainly understand that. So let's get started with our questions this week. Our first question comes from Case, and Case asked this. And Case, let's not do this anymore on questions. You, you, I have a dumb question for you today. Nah, it's, it's a question. It's not a dumb question or a bad question or even a good question. It's a question. I remember seeing a video you put up a while ago where you were saying that while the deadlift is a great exercise, if you are doing the Olympic lifts like snatches and cleans, there is no real need for doing deadlifts. And then you mentioned where you'd want a powerlifting meet without training for the deadlift. That's a true story. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, the, the 
the head of the captain of the powerlifting team walked up to me on Thursday and said that their 100 kilo lifter, 220, couldn't make it. And what I lift on Saturday at this meet. And because I was uh, me, I said, okay. And uh, Saturday morning at 9 a.m., I weighed in. Sunday morning at 3 a.m., I was deadlifting, uh, which was a long, long day. Um, there are certain exercises that blend across and through. That's why I have this thing called the movement matrix. Uh, if you're a member of Dan John University, uh, there's a whole bunch of articles about the movement matrix in there. And there's all these charts. Uh, in my book, Attempts, it's in there. And it's in, uh, well, whatever I wrote before Attempts and my mind just came to a stop. But you can get Attempts over at Amazon or on Target Publishing. If you get it on Target Publishing, uh, you also get the the, Ken, the e-book versions and the audio, which is nice. Um, at least I think there's an audio version. Uh, and then you mentioned, okay, uh, now here comes the dumb part, man. In a way, I feel like kettlebell swing is the deadlift of kettlebell exercises. And I really like that. I think there's, yeah, I, th I think you're right. I see the kettlebell swing and certain deadlifts as pure hinge movements. So I, I, uh, I like this. I, I, I think, you know, um, if a person has the ability to do kettlebell swings, yeah, maybe deadlifts aren't nearly as important. And I'm talking general population. I'm talking about the most broad swath uh, through humanity. Uh, I'm sure some powerlifting coach just uh, uh, threw up his breakfast of uh, pancakes, French toast, and peanut butter toast. Um, while it's a great exercise, I feel like the clean and snatch are, uh, give all the benefits of the clean plus a little extra. Would you say this is true for the swing, or am I oversimplifying things? Well, your, your question is, you know, your, 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 I think your point is right. And the only thing, let's go, let's go through, let me give this, let me answer this in two or three ways. First, beware of either or in the weight room. So don't get yourself in a, in a mental place of, I'm gonna start kettlebell swinging today and that's it for the rest of my life. Uh, on my deathbed, I'll still be, the bar will be, you know, still, you know, going up to my sternum height or whatever. Uh, there is a time and place for deadlifts. There's a time and place for kettlebell swings. Uh, a lot of people join me annually on the 10,000 swing challenge. Um, there's articles on T Nation about it where I first uh, published the articles because it was requested by the, the publisher of T Nation for me to do that. And then over at dandronuniversity.com, we have a little uh, workout generator area that gives you what to do every day, which is not bad. It's kind of helpful. Uh, there's also lots of gyms uh, will have it as an annual thing. Very common on the 1st of January. Uh, I've also seen it right before bikini season. So that kind of April and May time where people are trying to get back in shape. Uh, basically, you do 500 swings a day for 20 days. Now, Case, if you do that, if you decide to do, I'm going to do the 10,000 swing challenge, at the end of those 20 days, let's say that will take you maybe four weeks. That'll give you a give you two days off a week for four weeks at the end of that on day 29 or whatever it is uh sit down and say okay what did i learn and you you know take out a piece of paper and write out the lessons you learn uh from doing kettlebell swings it might be an idea after that to do some kind of uh i'm sorry some kind of like dedicated uh deadlift program at the end of that dedicated deadlift program you take out that same piece of paper and you write some stuff out i think what you're what, where you're, hesi you're, you're hedging towards, Case, is that for a lot of us, the kettlebell swing might be better, you know, most of the year than, say, just pure deadlifts. Having said that, there's going to be discus throwers, Highland gamers, uh, American football players who are need a lot more in that, uh, um, in, it, they're going to need a lot more for, the, for what's asked for what they're doing out on the field to play. For general population, I think the kettlebell world, uh, make sure it's possessive, kettlebell worlds, um, 
hinge family is probably better for the general population than the barbell deadlift. Having said that, so many people, when they do my easy strength program, that's uh, you pick five exercises, you do it for 40 days. Uh, when they make a good deadlift choice, uh, I, I have found in my own case, my two favorites for the 40 days are the snatch grip deadlift or the thick bar deadlift. Uh, my friend Bill did the Jefferson deadlift. Uh, he did a set of five this way and then a set of five this way. Uh, at the end of those 40 days, that two months, a lot of people say, I can't believe how much I learned deadlifting in a reasonable fashion five days a week for two sets of five. So just, I'm just, I guess, point number one is be careful of the either or of your question, but I, I think it's good. Uh, the second thing, <clears throat> there is something, there is a bit of a metabolism hit. In fact, I think, I think Teen Nation used that phrase, like the metabolic workout or something like that, when they first described the 10,000 swing challenge. There is a bizarre metabolic hit from the 10K challenge. Now, I've been doing it once a year for a long time, and I don't like it. I mean, I, you know, once you've done it once, you don't really want to do it twice. Uh, it's like a really good two-week diet. You, you never want to repeat that or uh, getting ready for a colonoscopy. You know, it's like they're not real fun things, you know. <laughs> it is interesting how my brain went right to colonoscopies. Ten, the 10,000 swing challenge and colonoscopies. There's my next book. <clears throat> Pardon me. So there is a bit more of a metabolic hit from those high rep uh, swing workouts. Um, can you get a metabolic hit from deadlifts? Oh yeah, in the story you referenced, it was two weeks after that that I was still kind of, I, I didn't feel right. Uh, you know, I pulled 628 at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, and for the next two weeks, I just felt kind of out of kilter, like my nervous system had been fried. Um, that is when you you do get some amazing benefits of heavy deadlifts that are really hard to explain. Your, your grip strength uh, just goes through the roof. Uh, you get very strong. Um, so I like your question. I, I, I would caution you about going to either or. Uh, I, I, I don't want you necessarily to forget the true benefits of deadlift, which, I mean, I gotta tell you, uh, it, with what I've seen with female athletes, the deadlift sometimes is that gateway to to high performance. Uh, once we get them deadlifting, uh, you know, in, in reasonable programs, or, you know, and give them some time with the bar, once women get to about 125 kilos in the deadlift or 275 in pounds, uh, you know, amazing things start to happen after that, truly amazing things. Uh, and I, that's the feedback I get from the athletes and their coaches. Uh, you know, what did you do to Edna? Well, you know, she, she's strong. Um, the last thing is, um, it's just a real strange one, but I think with the deadlift and the kettlebell swing, I think you got to pay a lot of mind, a lot of attention, a lot of focus on technique. Uh, I, I've never been a believer that, you know, saying an open-ended phrase like squats hurt your knees or deadlifts hurt your back or swings hurt your back. I, I've never liked those phrases. Uh, done correctly, I think if we just went over a, a great family of movements, squats, deadlifts, and swings. Having said that, with squats, deadlifts, and swings, um, done poorly, uh, issues show up very quickly. So one of the things I'd, I'd like to really ask you, Case, is be very mindful of your technique whenever you do these ex exercises. Uh, it is worth your time, energy, uh, to get good coaching, to go to a clinic, to go to a workshop, to hire someone who knows what they're doing to help you learn these movements. Uh, <clears throat> I've taught as a master kettlebell instructor, both at Strong First and the Russian, the RKC, uh, out of Dragon Door. Very proud of that. And one of the things I have noticed in this, uh, with the RKC and Strong First, often people who are certified will come back and I'll look at their movements and something has happened in the time after they've been certified, their technique has dropped. A lot of them start going back to doing dead hangs and things like that and they stop swinging every bell, which I think is the advantage. The swing is a swing, the clean is a swing, the snatch is a swing, and kettlebells. And a lot of people forget that when they 
they get away. Some people learn some really bizarre ways to put their hands on the things and it, it's never, I don't think it's really a good. So even if you're certified, it's important to make sure someone else's eyes are on you occasionally. So, I mean, you can certainly send me a, a YouTube video or, or whatever you want for me to check your technique, but make sure someone is looking at your technique and someone's adding corrections. Uh, case, that was a good question. Uh, it comes down very simply to this. Should I do the kettlebell swing? Uh, and the important thing is versus deadlifts. Both exercises have great value. I think you should have both in a long-term program. Uh, this is not an either, either or question to me. I think the swing has the advantage of being a little bit more of a, a metabolic hit to you. As I said, that's, the, that's what T Nations uh, said in the art article I published for them years ago on the 10,000 Swing Challenge. Uh, at the same time, the deadlift has an ability to show, <laughs> I mean, it allows you to demonstrate how strong you are. You get a real insight about how things are going in your whole system. You know, if I'm a 600 pound deadlifter and I do, a, you know, I do this magic training program I see online and then I go to max out of my deadlift and I deadlift 200 pounds, yeah, well, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I mean, it's okay to, for things to, to wave up and down some, but, you know, not crash. So, should you kettlebell swing? Done correctly, I think it's a fabulous exercise. Should you front squat? Done correctly, I think it's a fabulous exercise. Should you deadlift? Done correctly, I think it's a fabulous exercise. Make sure you have good coaching, you have good practice, you have good facilities, uh, you use your head, and those baby steps you take in the beginning, trying to get good technique, are so valuable long term. Thank you, Case. I hope that helped. Okay, first we have a we have a question from Johnny. He says, "I have been rock climbing since 13 years old. From 20 to 28, I climbed at an advanced level, but never quite reached the next level. Okay. Over the past months, I've been doing easy strength while following the tips, and fat loss happens on Monday. Well, that's interesting. Okay." Um, so, uh, yeah, Josh Hillis and I wrote Fat Loss Happens on Monday. Um, Josh is a brilliant young man out of Colorado, really knows this stuff. And the thing I like about Josh is he always uses the, the he always tends to work with the psychological side of fat loss, uh, using habits, using uh, skills, and I think that's important. Um, as I work with more and more adolescents around the country, I we have to teach those skills earlier and earlier and early. It's okay. Well, that's enough of my, uh, we'll move on. Okay. And now I'm climbing to my all time best due to the weight loss and strength gains. So the smart boy, uh, uh, Johnny, he combines a fat loss program with a good strength program to get stronger and leaner. And it works out. Uh, my question is the following. I have the option of climbing a little bit every day. And I was wondering if it would be a wise decision to train for walk, uh, rock climbing with the mentality of easy strength, climb every day, two to three sets of a climbing route that I will uh, set to be in the easy strength difficulty for me. Wow, that's an interesting idea. So his idea is to take rock climbing and go every day and play with the, the, the assaults, the summits, whatever the phrase would be. Yeah, yeah I, you had me at hello, Johnny. Okay, the way many climbers train, uh, coaches train is to train similar to the body weight programs where you go to your limit three days a week, taking rests in between. I've been going to the climbing gym only two days a week where I go to see friends and test my ability with them. If I attribute my recent gains to easy strength and weight loss and not so much work to the work being done at the climbing gym. Your thoughts are appreciated. I can't wait for the new improved easy strength to be released. Well, first off, man, Johnny, this is... This is great. Uh, so in my humble opinion, especially if you could be in a situation, boy, this would be good. If you could get your, uh, <laughs> on a daily program, let's just say you pick, you pick five exercises and I'm, and I'm just throwing these out randomly. Like, you know, uh, so a vertical press, a vertical pull, which makes sense for you. A hinge, like a deadlift, probably your best bet. Uh, um, ab wheel, and then some kind of loaded carries. Uh, the loaded carries will also help you, you know, with your backpacking when you go up to the real mountains. 
um, that little, so uh, maybe two sets of, uh, down and back with a suitcase carry, very little out every day. Um, two sets of five and everything, uh, even in the ab wheel, just keep it simple. So you're looking at about a 12 to 15 minute workout, at least the way I see it for me. And then while you're still kind of from the suitcase carry on an easy day, you take three easy summits and then, you know, um, bounce off the wall. Uh, on a day you really want to push it, maybe you do three medium summits and then walk out the door. Maybe the only thing I would say is that I would keep doing what you're doing where you once a week you go in and you challenge yourself because uh, that seems to be a good idea. But the other days, just get as good as you can at the skills you're trying to get at. Yeah, I think there's someone may say, well, Dan, you know, you know nothing about rock climbing and, and, and I'm out, out of my lane here. But I think that's in sports and performance coaching. I, that's how I learn is by talking to other disciplines and learning from other people. So, Johnny, I like this idea. Um, I like it a lot. Every time I get someone to focus on easy strength and what you did, nutrition, good things happen on body composition. When I get people to focus on easy strength and sports performance, good things tend to happen. What I like about what Johnny's trying to do, folks, is he is taking easy strength, sports performance, and body composition and blending it into a, a program where there's not a lot. If you'll notice, there's nothing crazy or extreme about anything he's doing. He's staying in that band of reasonable and, and, and making his progress obviously happen. This is very impressive. Um, over at uh, DJU, uh, we do have some easy strength templates. We have them for o Olympic lifting. We have them for fat loss, uh, we have them for kettlebells. And here's the thing, Johnny, uh, if this works out, uh, you get back to me if this works out. Now, if it doesn't work out, blame somebody else. But if this works out, uh, get back to me and maybe we can put together some ideas. This might be a fun little uh, article or something like that for uh, uh, your, uh, your blog, someone else's blog. Um, one of the things I like a lot is when I watch people like uh, bikejames.com, James over at bikejames.com, how he takes these very good ideas from the weight world and then helps people with mountain biking. And uh, I, I mentioned James a lot because I really enjoy his insights. So thank you. And maybe this is what we're going to do with you. Okay. Thank you. Good question. We have a question for, for Dustin, uh, from Dustin. And it's, it's one of those questions that's always, that, you know, is always tough for me. But l let's answer. And the reason these questions are tough, th they're asking my experience or my uh my opinion, that's your opinion, man, uh, on, uh, on, a, on an exercise. And it's always difficult to answer these questions because very often uh, I did these exercises four dec decades ago and tossed them out because they didn't work then. But we've come a long way since then and maybe the techniques are better, but let's go. What is your experience with the Nordic hamstring curl? It's funny, it's called that now. Do you believe it can reduce hamstrings injuries? How, do you, how would you program it? What do you believe are some great exercises for strengthening hamstrings and reducing hamstring injuries? Now, that's a totally different question, and I like in answering that one. So my experience with, uh, we used to call these sprinter curls. Now, this, this takes us back a long ways. Uh, they're not new. Uh, the Russians were doing, the Soviets were doing these a long time ago. I know that the 72 gold medalist Borzov, who wouldn't have won if, the American coach could read a time schedule. Um, that's a terrible story, but here we go. Um, Borzov did these. Uh, he did a lot of it. It was funny for a while there in the mid-70s. Uh, everyone would, no matter what Borzov did, people thought it was a second. He meditates. That's why he ran the 100 meters faster than anybody else. And he also did a lot of other stuff too. But back then we called the sprinters a curl. And then we also started seeing the, the Soviets, they were, they were doing, so, so follow this, you got the sprinter's curl, the Nordic curl. And then we also started seeing a lot of the, the Soviets doing uh, hyperextensions. And, and I did them, and I still think that the hyperextension is one of the least appreciated exercises there are. Um, I, I haven't had a system set up for a while. And once we started doing the uh, hyperextension, 
somebody came back from a, a, a tour of the Soviet Union and said, actually, they're doing, they're combining the hyperextension with the sprinter's curl and an exercise called the glute ham raise. And I worked with uh, Bigger, Faster, Stronger, and BFS was one of the first companies, I think anyway, to really push this GHR, uh, the glute ham raise. And what was interesting is that the Upper Limit Gym, which was a BFS thing, uh, we really started to push that. And the number of injuries in the hamstring area just went through the roof. Uh, there was a time, oh gosh, I've been, uh, it would be on the cusp of 1990, somewhere around there where it was kind of funny to see us all pulling our hamstrings doing exercises that were designed to stop us from pulling hamstrings. Um, so to follow, we went sprinter's curl to hyper. Sprinter's curls didn't work for us because we just didn't get any value. Hyper we loved, the G GHR uh, caused a lot of problems. And now the Nordic curl or the sprinter's curl has kind of come back again. Um, do I like them? Mm, not necessarily. I still think for the bulk of the people you're ever going to work with, I mean, you're, you're looking on sprinters curls, there's probably on the planet Earth, maybe 2,000 people is going to help. Well, And it's not going to help the other 8 billion. Now, for those 2,000 people, there's great value. Okay, maybe. For, for, for hamstring issues, um, I, I'm still old school on that. The best combination that I ever found, now I, I don't have this machine, but I always liked the, le the old fashioned leg curl. And the reason I liked the old fashioned leg curl is it allowed us to train that leg bicep family, like the bicep, uh, uh, it's funny we call it, we, I, there's a lot of us still call them the leg bicep, but there's actually, I think there's three, um, it doesn't matter. Uh, but you know, that curl, it allows you to play with reps. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is Art Devaney's idea. You do a set of 15 with a light weight, nice and slow. You go a little bit heavier without moving. You stay there a little heavier and you do about a set of eight and then you go as heavy as you can and do a, a fast set of four. Uh, I like that because it always felt like, to me, how the hamstring seems to work under fatigue out on the field of play. You know, you're fine, you're fine, and then it starts to burn. When I was young, the answer to all hamstring questions was the straight leg, stiff leg, deadlift, and the leg curl. Uh, I know a lot. I know that the straight leg uh, deadlift and the leg curl have really fallen out of favor. But, uh, you know, I, I know in my own personal experience, that combination seemed to really open things up. The question is this, the, the, well, how would I program um, the, the, the Nordic hamstring curls? Well, I wouldn't, I would never use them. That's, but that's me, I'm not a bad person. And I'm sure there's gonna be people, you know, uh, very often in the comments write, well, yeah, I use them all the time and good for you. Um, you, know, you know, I, I do all these, other, I do all these things in training that I, I would never necessarily recommend to, you know, blank lead every person on the planet earth, you know, squat snatches. <laughs> They're not recommended for everybody, you know. Um, so I wouldn't program it at all. But here's the thing. What do you believe are some great exercise for strengthening hamstrings and reducing hamstring injuries? I still think that deep front squats are the answer to almost all leg-related uh, training issues. Now, the brilliant exercise called the goblet squat, invented by probably the finest person in the history of the world. Uh, but the goblet squat with how it teaches that hip mobility and it, and it teaches a sit between, that there's great value in that. And the double kettlebell front squat, which I often teach very quickly to young people because it, we instantly can add load and we're taking the, uh, the wrists out of the issue. One of the things I get a lot of complaints and feedback on are the soreness of the hamstrings, which is something that makes me like it. And then of course, when we move up to the barbell front squat, uh, I really like that for a hamstring exercise. And the key is you have to go deep. And now what deep means is look at someone's goblet squat position and to see if they can get close to that in their barbell front squat position. Um, you'll hear phrases like ass to grass all the time, and, I, and I'm fine with that. But 
frankly, not all of us are built to do that. Where you know, I, my my deep front squat position. And by the way, when I clean heavy, I go much deeper than when I front squat because the load crashes me in a weightlifting meet deeper than I can uh, under my own control in the weight room, which is probably a scary thought. Um, but for me, it would be the family of exercises that you'd probably want to do, obviously, are the squat and the hinge family. So fairly deep, appropriate squats, uh, goblet, double kettlebell front squat, front squat. Um, for those of you who know my work, you, you'll notice I've, I've, I've ignored the overhead squat because for a lot of people, that isn't necessarily a hamstring. Uh, it, it's not a lower body exercise. It's a it's a whole body mobility test. And then of course, the whole deadlift family done correctly, done correctly. You know, I was there when Nico Vlad was doing those uh, Romanian deadlifts at the Olympic Training Center, and uh, it took me years to figure out what he was doing that for. And the Romanian deadlift might be by itself the the best. <sighs> again, done correctly, might be the best hamstring, lower back, butt exercise I know. <sighs> Oddly, so if you can do it right, <clears throat> I have a weird exercise called the Bulgarian goat bag swing. That's also a wonderful hamstring uh, exercise, but I can't necessarily, <laughs> just look at the videos and see if, it, see if you can use it. So the squat family, appropriate deadlifts, uh, and I gotta, I just gotta say this because this is the feedback I'm getting from my inner circle and some of my friends. The glute loop hip thrust seems to do marvelous things for the hamstring. And all I can tell you is that the human body is a lot more complicated than we think, but somehow working the glutes hard seems to do magic for the hamstrings. So that would be, that would be the, the, the thing I would recommend in, in a way that I can't necessarily prove why it works, but it works from people's experience. And uh, I have also picked up my own experience doing the half kneeling kettlebell press. Seems to do, you know, wonders for my hips. And after, if, I do, um, if I do light kettlebell presses before a walk, my legs feel better. So, and by the way, when it comes to legs and lower back, if an exercise makes you feel better, that's money. Um, I, I don't know if it's just some kind of prophylactic or what, or just some kind of <laughs> it's some you know brain trick. I don't care. It works for me. So, best exercises for the hamstrings, in my opinion, we're back to the hinge and squat family. Um, if you, if you want to build the hamstrings, make sure you go deep, get a view of your, take a picture of what you look like at the bottom of a gobble squat. Try to do the same thing with a either double kettlebell uh, front squat or barbell front squat. Try to achieve that same position. Uh, <clears throat> from my experience, <clears throat> sorry about that. From my experience, that's, that's just a, a, a game changer. When it comes <clears throat> to the hinge family, a lot of people have said that high rep kettlebell swings seem to stretch out the hamstring better than anything they've ever done. I found that to be true too. Uh, the deadlift family, again, done correctly, seems to be magic for the hamstrings. And oddly, the hip thrust, and I can't explain why that happens. Uh, Dustin, that's a good question, and thank you very much. Good stuff. Greg asked a question. He says this, I recently revisited an episode from a while back when you talked about focusing on a different type of training for each season. Um, he summarizes it with spring running in the spring, uh, pardon me, sprinting and running in the spring, bodybuilding in the summer, Olympic, Olympic lifting in autumn, and powerlifting in the winter. Boy, if I said that, I'm a smart kid because that's not bad. I really like this idea. And I think it would be good for me as the kind of person who is always trying to chase every rabbit he sees. That's great. My question is regarding the Autumn Olympic list. <laughs> the Autumn Olympic list. Thank you, Greg. That's lovely. <clears throat> I never really train the Olympic list and don't always have a place where I can access the kind of gym I would need. 
Do you think I could substitute kettlebell work instead and just focus on similar qualities? Yeah. Uh, then he says he's got some ideas about, <clears throat> you know, doing the armor building uh, complex, doing the Olympic lift versions, the same thing. I like that. And let's just say it this way, Greg. Let, let's just do that. Let's just go with that. I'm just going to run with your ideas here. Can you substitute all your training with just kettlebells? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, let's let's run through the run through your list here. Um, let's start with the. Okay. Let's start with the Olympic lifting in the autumn. So Olympic lifting, uh, the autumn po program would be, yeah. Okay. So in the autumn, instead of doing some of the stuff you're talking about, how about that? You know, take a month in the autumn and do the 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 ten thousand swing challenge. That's the, you know, 500 swings a day for 20 days. Um, will you get the benefits of an Olympic lifting program? Well, yeah, especially if you, in between the sets of uh, swings, you add some uh, uh, vertical presses, any of, the, any of the vertical presses in the kettlebell world. I think you're going to have a pretty good little workout there. Uh, you're going to get most of the benefits of my usual Olympic lifting programs. And if you decide... And if you decide to do goblet squats in your warm up, that's not a bad little month, one month. Um, maybe after that, I've got uh, over at uh, DJU, I've got classic conditioning in 10 months. You could do two rounds of that, uh, very organized kettlebell workouts. Uh, I think it's, there's uh, 10 moves. So, so there's only 10 exercises in the program. There's a conditioning day with kettlebells. There's Tabata days with kettlebells. Um, yeah, there you go. Classical conditioning in 10 moves on one month, the 10,000 swing challenge the next month, and classical conditioning in 10 moves. There's, 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 your, there's your autumn, and it's not bad. Um, you say powerlifting in the winter. Okay, so let's stick with it. If you're just using kettlebells, that those three months would be those hard workouts where you do the double kettlebell front squat and double kettlebell vertical presses. Probably the double kettlebell press, okay? Um, I like the idea, as I've stated before, you do two, three, five in the double kettlebell front squat or two, three, five, 10 if the weight's too light. And you, you, you wave it in. You just take the two bells, clean them, set a two, set a three, set a five, set a 10. Set a two, set a three, set a five, set a ten, two, and you try to get your numbers up to a high range. Um, I would suggest if you do the two, three, five, that sets of ten. So you'd want to be in that area of anywhere from thirty to fifty total reps. If you're doing the ten with lighter weights, I have the workouts where I try to get up to one hundred. So two, three, five, ten, five times uh, with the press. You can follow the exact same template, and there you go. There's your, <laughs> there's your three winter months. Of you, you're gonna go heavy, go hard, and go home. Those those two exercises by themselves is are illuminating. Now you'll notice you're not haven't done any hinges, which brings us to spring. Now spring comes around, and for three months I'd like you to focus if you can, uh, if you know the exercises on the Turkish getup and the kettlebell snatch because we're trying to get you outside to, to have a little spring in your step and get going. I'm just sticking with the template the way you wrote it, Greg. Um, but in the spring, you know, maybe uh, um, I've got that RKC prep program over at the site, but maybe you just want to follow like a snatch only. So, I mean, I would suggest one day a week doing lots of snatches. So anywhere from... <laughs> 100 to 300 snatches, depending on how, you know, how good you are and how, <laughs> how insane you are. Um, three days a week, Turkish get-ups, or, you know, do it like Pat Flynn says, you know, do it for time, like 10 minutes, and then uh, snatch. And then get out and, then get out and get your running, your sprinting, your hill work, whatever you decide to do. Um, after those three months of front squats and presses, the Turkish get-up, the snatches and the sprints are going to feel a little different and of course once you get to the summer I mean, it's time to look good I would say once a week to the armor building complex complex that's double kettlebell clean for two one press three front squats 
bell down, repeat as many times as you can. Um, and wow, do that one day a week. Do your winter uh, double kettlebell front squat, double kettlebell press one day a week. Do your Turkish get up snatch day, another day of, of the week with the sprinting. And then get out in the sun and enjoy yourself. You know, Greg, that's that's just off the top of my head, but you know, that, that's not bad. That's not bad. In fact, and you know, my highest praise is pretty good. And I would say if you did that, that's a pretty good program. So can you substitute all your training with kettlebells? You certainly can. Real quick, if I can remember everything as best I can, uh, if you decide to have a year-long template, template with just kettlebells in fall, autumn, classical condi conditioning in 10 moves, go to Dan John University. 10,000 swing challenge, month three, classical conditioning in 10 months. The winter months, I'm sorry, the winter months, got excited. Double kettlebell front squat, double kettlebell press, three days a week, two, three, five, or 10, um, up to as many reps as you can get done. Mix in, you know, hard days with medium days with light days. Spring comes around, 10 minutes of Turkish get-ups, kettlebell snatches, get out there and get your sprints and your runs in three days a week. Summer, armor building complex on one day, your winter double press, double squat day, the third day, the TGU snatch day, and uh, report back to me in 365 days. I hope that helps. That's a pretty good little program, and it'd be, I, I as, you know, as crazy as I can be, I, I think that might be a, a nice little program. Boy, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, Carl has a question. He says, Dan, I'm 72 and reasonably good health and spent 15 years with gym trainers. Two years ago, I want to increase mobility and strength, and after research, I purchased a 16-gram kettlebell and took lessons from a certified instructor. Well, hats off to you. Everything you think you just said there makes me happy. Uh, you, you, that's the way we should progress. You, you studied it, you bought it, you learned. I love it. I have since purchased bells from 12 to 24. I swing, clean, press, snatch, squat, and suitcase carry. Love it, love it, love it. My shoulder and internal hip rotation limitations prevent me from uh, doing a complete uh, Turkish getup, so I eliminate that from the workouts. And those slight partial moves are just fine too, my friend. I am interested in learning more about easy strength. Based on what uh, I have been doing, which book should I purchase to get me started? I am also con considering joining your personalized workouts. Well, Carl, I don't know why you're not. I mean, don't, don't take this wrong, but your membership at Dan John University gives you, I mean, I would say hundreds of pages of easy strength materials, including workouts based for kettlebells on easy strength. Um, I do have a new book we're working on. It, I, you know, we're up I, as I'm speaking right now. If you've ever written a book, you, I'm in that weird. I don't know what's happening, but I know what's happening. But you know, it's a, it's a process. Things getting done, but a whole bunch of that book is available already on the site. Uh, I will be updating. Uh, a lot of the materials on the site with all this new information. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the way, uh, I think that's what I'm suggesting for that. I like the fact that you, you, you know, the fact that you've gone to certified coaches already, it's, it seems natural for you to, to sign up at the site and move on. Um, there, it, it's a bit vague on what you're asking here in my sense, except it seems like when, when someone asks a question like, um, you know, what, you know, what, what, what book do you recommend? That's always tough, especially when I'm in the middle of a book coming out. But let me just say, to answer the question about a book, uh, I have a book called Attempts that has a lot of easy strength materials in it. It's available at On Target Publishing and on Amazon. If you get it at OTP, you also get the Kindle and the audio version, which, you know, it's up to you. It might be better. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, you're gonna have to wait a little bit for the Omni book, but the materials are sitting there for you at DJU. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, so this is our last question. I'm sorry about that. Uh, this is our last question is from Chris. Chris, I'm 45 years old now, 5'11", 168. That's, that's good. Pretty active and in good shape. Thing is, I've never focused on building mass. You know, it's funny, those of us who did sometimes sit back and wish we didn't. So, uh, I've always played sports that required a wiry and explosive physique. So I've always trained for strength and power, which I love. And any muscle uh, built was a byproduct of my training, not the end goal. Now at the end of 45 and looking 20 to 30 years down the road, I want to try to build some muscle and do a proven hypertrophy program. After all, how many 90 year olds do you know have said, man, I wish I had less muscle mass. Um, from the 90 years old people I know, uh, like my friend and coach Dick Knottmeyer, uh, that is the one of the things he reminds me about all the time. Eat your protein and lift weights. He's 91 now. He's still doing well. His mind is as sharp as a razor blade. And I do agree with you. Muscle mass is important for uh, longevity, uh, quality longevity. Uh, so with MMS, would you make any modifications given my age? Any advice modifications about recoverability, nutrition, activity levels, etc.? Uh, and then finally he says, I would assume that mass made simple will be somewhat of a shock cycle. So my plan would be to run it as written unless you advise otherwise and then transition to easy strength to maintain and afterwards. Well, you're 45 and at 168, you'll be using uh, 185 as your, as your squat weight. Uh, frankly, uh, I would say the most important thing I would do if I were you before you even start on it is, is I would practice for maybe a month, um, uh, just practice squatting twice a week, back squatting twice a week, and just getting a sense of it. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're back squatting twice a week for a month and you, you can't squat 185 or you struggle with, with the heavier weights, then, then we're going to have to, to change. That's my best advice for you. Now, when it comes to like the complexes, using just the barbell is fine. If you have no shoulder issues on the press, and now if you do, email me and we'll try to, you know, we'll come up with another complex for you. Uh, I have lots of complexes. If you complex, uh, pardon me, if you Google my name, Dan John, and the word complex, a PDF will come up, and that has all my various complexes I use uh, when I train people. And maybe one of those complexes might be better for you uh, than the one that's advised in the book. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend for you at your age is don't do the six-week uh, uh, version. Uh, do the seven-week one where you only lift twice a week. Uh, that might that might be all you need for adjustments. Now, it also says that you need to shovel food down your mouth mouth constantly um, you're gonna have to make a uh, you're gonna have to make a, a, a decision on that uh, do you do you want to be shoveling food down your throat at age 45 frankly and I like w what you're saying here if you know um, seven week period you do add some body fat because you are trying to increase your lean body mass you know you're not gonna put on 60 pounds of flab you're not I mean uh, uh, most of the time people said you know I've had people tell me they put on 13 pounds and uh, one or two of it was fat you know with those little scales that they can use and my thought is yeah but that's 11 pounds of lean body mass and when you stop force feeding your body the, that lean body mass is gonna, is gonna stick around and the fat you know, your, your metabolism is now higher. I can't remember the exact number, but it's uh, lean body mass is the, the building lean body mass is the fastest way to increase your metabolism, uh, no matter what the supplement companies and the, the people on the different social media sites lie to you about. It, it is the single best. Um, I guess when I hit my, I hope that's still working. Um, so th th those are my ideas. Uh, I like what you're saying. Uh, mass made simple as an adult is always interesting. And uh, let's let's hope it works. Um, listen, Chris, if you do start it, make sure you get the book, fill out the paperwork, uh, you know, the, the workouts, and uh, let me know how you do. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, there's another uh, edition uh, down, which is amazing. Uh, 
as we, we sneak up to the next year of these. Uh, remember, if you have questions, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning.